Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our third live stream broadcast from Rowe Gallery here in beautiful Tlacopaki. I'm Ken Rowe, if I haven't met you, and this is Little Snicklefritz, my good friend. Um, first and foremost, I hope all of you are doing well. Um, your family, your friends are all safe. Uh, we're doing well here. We're working remotely for the most part. My wife, Monica, is here from 11 to 5 every day, so if it makes sense, we're actually the doors are closed, but we are open for business. And you guys proved it this week with all the inquiries you had and sales. It's been phenomenal. So um, I can't wait till this is all over with. The, Talakapaki, when I walk these beautiful grounds, would be the equivalent of a park ranger in the Grand Canyon saying, look at the beautiful geology and colors and nobody being there to enjoy it. So. This place is a treasure. It's been my sculpting home for 25 years. And as I said, I cannot wait till this is over to see your faces and talk to you in person and make Tlacopaki breathe again. So let's just uh, count the days that happens. So that brings us to why we're here, the live stream. And if we're gonna make lemonade out of lemons, that's what this is all about. The disclaimer is I'm learning a lot. This is a technology that I'm not very familiar with and I want to make this more interactive than I have in the past two sessions and answer questions live and acknowledge those that are chiming in. Um, the response from this has been phenomenal. It's been way beyond my highest expectations, very flattering, um, and lots of great comments and questions. So what I'd like to do is start off with answering some of the questions from last week. I'll apologize to those that I haven't had a chance to address in person. But let's start here. I'll put my little buddy down, Fritzy. Okay. Oh, so this is a question from my good friend, uh, Warren and Lorna. You know who you are. And what it's inquiring about is um, my knowledge of anatomy and basically him not knowing or realizing how much goes into building the skeleton and the, and the, and the uh, muscles and so on and so forth from the inside out. So this question was, I mean, there had to be more influence other than anatomy to get to this level. And I think that it just proves I'm, I'm from a family of engineers. I want to know how things work. And that means animal anatomy and working with the skeleton and everything else. I've always been intrigued with it. So here I am, fast forward all these years later, practicing my obsession. So thank you again for your comments. This one is, oh, from my good friend Jan. Jan is using the same armature technique that I'm using here. I taught her years ago how to use it. And her question is, is how do I put the arm bones in or the leg bones into a human armature? Do I plug them in later or do I put them in in advance? So I'll show you a human armature. So this is what I build in advance of doing a piece such as this fly fisherman in the window. So what I'll do is build this based on the mathematical measurements and now I can position this in any way I want right here. So there's my armature for the human figure. So if Jan has already built the torso and the, and, and the head and neck without putting these in, that's not a problem because what I would do is take, let's say that's the human armature, that's the, the, le the arm, scapula and so forth, I would just take that wire and plug it into the torso and then you, there you have the arms. Okay, so it's all movable. And you can do that same with the legs too. So... Um, on, in this particular session too, um, the great input I've had is I want it to be longer, which to me is a great compliment because our segments have been short. I didn't want to bore anybody, but I'm glad to spend more time. And today, with the project I'm going to be working on, we'll have at least 20, maybe even 30 minutes into this piece. So um, anyway, we will go on to what I've worked on this week. So. I'll do a brief overview of what's happened thus far. Okay, we use live reference, which is, that's me, eight, I think 18 years ago, with Simba, and then so I sculpted with the cat in front of me, with Simba itself. 
I did this piece in the field, small so I could do it quickly. Then I've scaled it up to this size. Now this is my working model that I will mathematically scale to this almost seven foot long version. So if you go to our website, our new website that's getting a great response, click on the Facebook icon and you'll see our archive shows from the previous two segments. So last week we checked the progress. I went from the skeleton to making the bones on camera and then what you saw was the torso kind of fleshed out. So this week, let's see what I've done. Okay, so as you can see, I have fleshed this thing out. And if you remember, the skeleton that I use as a point of reference constantly is still there. These bony protrusions are points of reference. And then last week, we put this big forearm muscle in. Well, you can see now how I've built and built and built all these muscles from the origin to the insertion based on everything that's like the domino effect. I just build it from the inside out. It still looks very alien because of the skull, but that's what we're going to be working on today is the face. So um, I'll move around and show you how I'm going to work on this face. Okay, so amazing points of reference that I really use a lot in the skeleton and so forth, um, no more important than on the skull because all these, the teeth, the septum, the insertion of the eyelids, all those areas are constant points of reference for me. And as you know, this whole thing is flexible. So uh, I'm going to show you how that benefits me. If I'm working on the piece and I think, okay, oh, I want to move that leg a little bit or I want to move the head, I'll show you what happens. Okay, so now you can see the face, and I'm going to start working on this guy, and um, I, have to, I laughed at myself earlier this week because I sculpted these eyes, and of course that goes in first, right? And so I'm working on the torso, and I've got these eyes in, and you're going to see this looks like a science fiction <laughs> movie, but that is how I build it. So this, to me, is my training in taxidermy, okay? But here's the funny thing I had to laugh at myself. I put the eyes in, and I'm working over here, and this thing was staring at me. And I thought, I've got to take these eyes out. It's just really freaking me out. So anyway, that's what I did. So let's make sure I have... I'll show you how I did the eye. I'll grab some clay down here. And my wife's missing turkey roaster. And as simple as that looks, that's probably, oh, six hours worth of work to make sure it's the exact size and shape. So I'm just going to do a reenactment. So let's say this is the size. I'm going to plug it in. And I'm going to make it looking forward by flattening that a little bit and shaping it. Okay, now... Um, I make a lot of my own tools, and this is one of, out of necessity, I made yesterday. This is simple baling wire. Okay, so I can adjust the size of that loop. Then I go in. And start the pupil. Okay. Then, I want to add more to this. Let me grab my other tool. This is another element that I really like. And I'm going to plug that in. All right. Now. Now we have the basic start of an eyeball. Okay. Now this point right here is the connection of the upper lid and the lower. And I'm going to use that as a point of reference. So I'll pull this out. Now, I mentioned before some of the stories I've had with close encounters. And let me tell you, this was one of the most amazing encounters I ever had. And we're going to have Randy pull up, or Lee pull up, some footage of me working with Simba and why I think it's so important to work with live reference. So if we can go to that. 
I'll put the sign in. Look at that face and those eyes, how focused they are. The nose and the muzzle. This piece that we see here start off in the privacy of my studio as a basic study. And it's not until I see the live animal that I can make my refinements. So the basic proportions are here, and I'm going to do my refinements to make it what I hope will be a live mountain lion. These just these very, very small subtleties make the difference. The scapula, the humerus, all these bones connect. The muscles overlap. But most importantly is this face. Look at that. Look at the focus in those eyes. He is something else. So you can see why I think it's so important to work with these animals, maybe out of selfish reasons. But can you imagine touching that animal like I did and petting his face and then sculpting the piece? It just gives me goosebumps right now to think about it. So, and, and it also reminds me, people often ask, what is the most dangerous moments you've ever had working with an animal but what you didn't see in that footage was shortly after that was taken my friend Casey Anderson who's now the National Geographic host and an amazing wildlife handler um, we had worked with Simba all day and Simba was getting cranky but we didn't really see that coming until it was too late Simba attacked Casey and um, he had a lanyard of mace. Casey had a lanyard of mace here. I hear this going on. I run over and Casey's going, get the mace. Well, he's got the cat by the throat right here. The cat's mouth is open and it's, Simba is trying to kill him. And what happens, we provoked Simba so much and I poked and prodded him and he just had enough and he was letting us know. Well, Casey was so composed, um, and anyway, what happened was probably only lasted about maybe 30 seconds, and let me tell you, I saw the damage that could be done from those claws. Simba let go, sat on the ground, arched its back, and hissed at all of us like, I just had it with you guys, and we're all standing there, Casey's bleeding, and he said, put the leash on it, act like nothing happened, let's walk back to the vehicle. So anyway... Uh, off to the hospital we go, Casey got stitched up, and it's in his book, which I think is a must read, The Story of Brutus. This is an amazing read, and it, it just is a great reflection of Casey and his instinctive ability to work with animals and know how to keep those circumstances like I just described to you from happening again. So I, I highly recommend that book if you would. Okay, so let's get back to our little alien here. Now, this is what I love. I love doing the face. And I save, once I flesh this out, of course, it makes this make more sense. If I had sculpted this first, it would have looked way too big and it throws off my proportions along the way. So I started here, and now we're going to do the face. All right, so... This system is basically, that's going to be the upper eyelid. So here's my origin of the upper eyelid. All right. So look at that already. Now, let's put a little eyelash in there. Okay. Now, what I can do with that being... I know it's accurate based on measurements I have. I can totally change that animal's expression by raising and lowering that eyelid, just like real life. So I can't think of a better example of how important it is to build these things from the inside out. If I started out here, that wouldn't make sense. So now, if I want him to be mad, I can make him mad. If I want him to be more relaxed, I can do that. And I'm going to start here with kind of that view. All right. Now we're going to put the lower eyelid in. Mm 
much thinner. And let's see if I can sculpt that lid in advance. Here, all right, now, that point there, here. Okay, so there you go. Now, if I want it up here, I can move it around and totally adjust the expression on that cat's face just based on those upper and lower eyelids. So to me, that, that is just absolutely, um, this, this is why I love doing faces because I, I can see results just so quickly. Now, let's put more up on this upper eyelid because that's gonna be way out there. We'll blend it in. Oh, good. This is interesting how wonderful to be able to work with such a beautiful animal. I didn't know the rest of the story. Casey is a very brave person. If Simba would have gone for you when you touched him with Casey and been able to pull him away. Oh, yeah. I'm sure. And that question came from Kim Corey about would if, if the role was reversed where Simba had attacked me and Casey was trying to rescue me, I'm sure <laughs> he would have done a much better job than I did. Um, but you know, it's just, you just never know. And um, actually I've never been injured by an animal. No, well, let's say this, the most, the worst injury I ever got from any animal was a raven. And, and it totally tricked me into reaching into his cage. And when I did, like the dumb human, um, he quickly cut my finger. And so um, luckily to this day, that's my, my most serious injury. So by the way, and that reminds me, Randy, who just asked the question, I want to take full advantage of this live stream. And I, I'm, I'm learning as I'm going. So answering questions live, I think, is really important and acknowledging those that are chiming in. So feel free to do so. And um, I'll show you this. Okay. All right, now we're getting somewhere with that eye. So those bones, that zymatic arch and this eye orbit influences everything I'm doing here. And of course, these points of insertion right here. Now, watch what happens. Further influencing the expression on this animal. And that is this brow really important. Okay. And I can move that around and make him look more aggressive just by moving that down like that. So let's blend this in a little bit. Now also I must say that what I'm doing here in a matter of minutes usually would take me probably a day or two to do this and make it make sense. So I'm just doing a Reader's Digest version, for lack of a better term, on this demonstration. Okay, more up here. Up here. There. Here. Now I'm going to work my way down to the muzzle, or the mouth area. But I want to make this, again, it's like the domino effect. If I can refine this just a little bit more, it makes this make more sense. Okay. There we go. Now, this is going to lead us into the mouth and nose area. So this is the, the septum in the middle. This is where the, the uh, skull terminates. So now I'm going to make this nose make sense. So I've roughed in this part of it. I'm going to define where the pad of the nose is. Let's just say it's there. 
And now I'm going to put the wings of the nostril on. All right, there we go. Now I'm going to guesstimate the width for now. All right. Now with those wings on, it helps me adjust this part of the nose. Incoming question, Ken. Okay. How long will Simba be when finished? Oh, the question that just came in is how long will it be for me to finish Simba? This, this piece, my goal is to have it done by Christmas. And so it's kind of a, what, what timing, right? Here I am working full time on this. I will probably have it to the foundry in Prescott that I use by the end of July. And uh, that will give them enough lead time to make a mold of this and start the casting process. And that reminds me another question too, is somebody asked, Sylvia asked basically, um, is this available? And yes, the answer is definitely yes. It's an addition of 20. And based on the foundry bid that we get, they will honor the first five at a certain price. You can go to our website to find out what that is. But people are reserving it in advance. Um, my goal is to have the first three done by Christmas. Uh, I think that's feasible. So it can be reserved prior to it being casted. And... Um, We'll get it to you. Okay, so I'm going to put the left eye in just very quickly and much rougher than this, just so it makes more sense here. I'm going to adjust this angle a little bit back. There we go. Again, upper eyelid. And that shadow that's cast in the pupil is critical. If I didn't have this built up, this brow is very heavy on a cat because it's, it's just it's fleshy and there's a lot of hair on it. And that shadow they cast make them look very, very ominous. Put the upper eyelid in. Okay. There we go. Lower eyelid. Very quickly. Okay. I'm going to take that off. I think. Yeah. Let's try another one. Okay, that's better. Okay. Now, we are going to to do the mouth. Well, wait, no, we're not. <laughs> I'm going to throw this in. Oh, oh, it's so flattering to hear comments. We just had somebody chime in and thanking us so much for doing this. And I mean, this, this is my obsession. And I, Monica and I were talking this morning. I've been sculpting in Tlacopaki in public now for 25 years. So it's, it's my home. And I love showing people how these pieces begin. And this is, this is an unusual opportunity for me because typically I wouldn't be working on this in the gallery but you know because of the circumstances we're in I guess that's a blessing in a way that I'm able to share this and uh, I'm flattered that everybody's enjoying it okay so eyes nose and now the lips So this is going to require a lot more clay. But, so now here is, okay, so that's the middle of the nose right there. Just drawing that in. Okay, so that makes more sense. 
Now, that tells me where this starts. Okay, it would start right there, right? So, and this, this canine influences how far it goes. So what happens is, you know, when a cat um, has his lip relaxed, the canine doesn't show. It's got to protect that. That's a weapon for obvious reasons. So the lip goes right. Another question for you, Ken. Yeah. Yes, the question is, will you be able to, will we be following this through the entire casting process? And the, and the answer is yes, gladly. Um, so after I'm done with this and everything is flushed out, um, we will take this to a mold maker and you'll see footage of that. And that's the next step. And after the mold maker gets the mold done, we'll go to the foundry and show you what's called the lost wax process. So we will be able to share that with you. Uh, oh, thank you, BJ, for chiming in. It's so, it makes it so much fun to hear that. Okay, so I'm working my way up. Now, this is obviously, obviously very fleshy area, but here's a cool thing about a mountain lion that makes them so unique in the cat family, is the muzzle isn't just a round bulb like a domestic cat. They have these really amazing angles to them. So I'm going to put this, this is kind of the wing of the nostril too, coming up. All right, that gives me a point of reference here. You were Ron Sidaway, just questioning. I know we've gone over it, but I wanted you to be aware of the question. Were you formally trained in anatomy, which I asked you before too, because yes. you know so much. Of course, it's your taxidermy, I believe. Yes, yeah, Ron, Ron, thank you for the question. Yeah, and it's true because anatomy is just pounded in your head when you work with taxidermy. But I think, I think added to that is the fact that I'm just obsessed with it anyway. And so it has taught me so much. And, and every time I do something like this, it reinforces the fact that I am totally obsessed with, with what I'm doing because I can see results so fast. And just think of this, when I look at an animal, It'd be like a painter looking at a mountain range. They look at colors and values and where you start from the inside out. And that's what I'm doing with this. Um, so it's just paramount that I have this in front of me, the skeleton. Okay, so now I talked about the angles of a mountain lion that make it so unique. This angle right here is so unique to a mountain lion. And this comes up here and here and here. So working in the field now, again, I, as I, you saw in that footage, me working with Simba, touching the head, the muzzle, everything, and now reaching over and working on my piece. So this is another great line right here that a mountain lion has. The very heavy brow here. Sally Van Wert weighs in, we treasure our quail pair. <laughs> Yes, Sally. Live models in your gallery, <laughs> oh, Sally just chimed in. She has one of my quail pieces, and she had the honor of meeting Feathers, one of my wa wildlife models, who's a gamble quail, and I actually brought, her, brought him into the gallery as I sculpted the piece. So he was the model for three of my um, quail pieces, and he loved people. So when um, people would come in, he would want to sit on your shoulder, and of course he was great for me because I could actually touch him and I, he'd let me open his wings up a little bit and measure the wings and sculpt my piece. Um, and he had a very refined taste. I mean, he loved wine, red wine, coffee with creamer, and poppy seed muffins. So um, we spoiled him and the, the joke in the gallery was I paid him $15 an hour. My wife said, uh, you pay that quail more than me and I'm going to get a raise out of this. And so uh, she was right, <laughs> you know. Okay, so again, this is an abbreviated version. I'm going to put the other lip in. 
I'm going to move this head a little bit there. Okay. So we, as I said before, we're going to check the progress of this piece every week. But next week, we have one of our amazing artists coming in to demonstrate. And I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag. This is the cat. I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag as to who it is. I'm just going to tell you that her paintings are as bright and vivid as her personality. And see if you can figure that out. So she'll be demonstrating in the courtyard. We'll check the progress on this. And then um, we'll have our little guest artist out here in the courtyard. So also I want to ask for input. Um, you guys have been fantastic with telling me what you want to see and the questions you've had. And that is, what time do I air this? Is 8 o'clock still good for you or would you like to see it later? And the majority will rule on this. So please give us some input as to what you'd like to see because I'm glad to do whatever works for you. Okay. Now, this is very rough, but it's a start. We're going to do one more thing here. That makes this make more sense. And adds to the personality of the piece. I'm going to put the bottom lip in for sure. So far people commenting in that eight, <coughs> excuse me, that 8 a.m. is good. Okay, so far 8 a.m. is the is the feedback we're getting, so that's great. So you can't see it from on, on your angle, but I've sculpt, actually sculpted the, the lower incisors on that jaw, and they're actually showing through the lip just as it would be in real life. Okay. Now, we're going to pretty much wrap it up today. And uh, again, I appreciate your comments and your response has been phenomenal. I hope this has been a little bit longer for you. I have no concept of time when I'm doing this, so. If you have any more questions, please, please do so. And let me grab something here. And again, this would not be happening today or the last two times without Red Rock TV. I encourage you to go to this because as I said before, we miss you. Before you get here, go to this free app that they're offering. It will tell you all your travels, destinations, dining, trails, galleries. It's an amazing tool to use, so please do so. Okay, with that said, I'm going to put the ear in, and then I'm going to say goodbye until next week. Ah. And really enjoying and uh, what a great idea he shares. Really enjoying it. Thank you, Al, for chiming in. We look forward to seeing you back in the gallery. Okay, so that's going to be pretty much it until next week. But you can see the method of my madness now. I can put that head back in place where it's supposed to go. And we'll go from there. Thank you so much.